Hi, and welcome to Standard Precautions and Beyond, Conversations in Infection Prevention and Control, a podcast of the Alabama Regional Center for Infection Prevention and Control, Training and Technical Assistance, or ARC-IPC. My name is Mina Nabavi, and I'm a program manager with the ARC-IPC at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health. Although it's pumpkin spice season, another pandemic winter is about to arrive. Though no completely new variants of the COVID virus have emerged yet, there are several new Omicron subvariants. As we all know, the Omicron variant first surfaced in the fall of 2021, and during the past year, various Omicron variants have primarily been responsible for COVID cases. First, there was the B1.1529, and then there was BA1, BA2, BA3, and then a little later, BA4 and BA5. But now there are some new kids on the block, and that's a throwback reference for my fellow 90s kids. There's BA 4.6, which is descended from the BA 4, and accounts for roughly 10% of COVID cases in the United States. Additionally, BQ 1 and BQ 1.1 account for more than 35% of cases in the U.S. as of the time of this podcast being recorded on November 11th, 2022, and that's according to the CDC's variant tracker. There's also another subvariant known as XBB, which has been responsible for an increase in cases in Singapore and about 26 other countries around the world. So to help us answer some of our questions about these new variants, we have invited Dr. Suzanne Judd, director of the Lister Hill Center for Health Policy, and a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Alabama at Birmingham to join our podcast. So thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. So Dr. Judd, that's at least four new variants. Why are we monitoring these variants and what are scientists hoping to learn? So one of the things we learned with influenza is that as we monitor the way a virus mutates, we can be better prepared in terms of vaccines. So it just makes sense for us to watch the variants, notice how they're spreading. One thing that was unique with COVID, early on, the earliest variants of COVID didn't spread very quickly, but they had a really high kill rate, which is scary, or mortality rate. Um, That's scary. That's what we worry about. We worry about diseases where one in 10 people might die if they're infected. And it looked early on like COVID might be that type of virus. As COVID mutated, it became better at moving from one person to the next, but not as good at causing harm. Although it still causes a lot of of harm for people, it's it's not what it was in the beginning. So I think one of the big reasons that we track the the way a virus mutates is, is that our big fear is that it will be able to spread very rapidly and also be lethal. So we're we're watching how the virus recombines to see uh, what it might do in the future. So how worried should we be about these new variants? So far, they're very similar to variants we saw in the summer in terms of the type of um, how dangerous they are, whether or not they're going to send you to the hospital, um, how likely they are to uh, wind up in death if an individual is infected. They're very similar to the the uh, variants we've seen in the summer, but we'll still keep our eye on them as they continue to, to change. So do you think that we're headed into another surge it's tough to say that there are a lot of uh, upper respiratory infections. So these are the ones you hear about that we used to just call the flu or a cold. Now people know the names of the viruses and right. they talk about RSV and they talk about influenza and COVID, all upper respiratory infections. They're all starting to, to go up. Um, so we'll be watching them carefully to see if it is going to lead to a surge. Here in Alabama, we've been seeing roughly six month surges. About every six months, the virus cycles through. We usually get a peak in January and another peak in July or August. So we probably are due for another COVID surge. Uh, but but again, we'll just have to keep watching to see. So let's talk about how people can protect themselves. And I guess, you know, expanding, protecting themselves from COVID, but also these other respiratory illnesses that you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the way that respiratory diseases are typically spread from one person to the next are through droplets. So when you're normally talking, you might accidentally have droplets that are coming out of your lungs. Uh, then those droplets might contain viruses if you are infected with a particular virus. When you're in close contact with somebody, like family members where you're standing very close to, and it makes it easy for those droplets to get onto you, that the disease can be spread from one person to the next. That's why you hear a lot about close contact. 
So when you're in situations where you're really close to someone, which are going to be more in intimate uh, settings, family settings, and even sometimes at work, you may want to mask up. You may want to make sure that um, it's not too terribly loud because another thing that we know is that the louder it is in the room, like Thanksgiving, people talk louder and even right. more of those droplets come out. Right. So so it's, it's good to try to keep the noise level down so people can communicate at a lower volume and produce less droplets. Um, singing produces a lot of droplets uh, when you're in close contact. So those types of things, if you can minimize them when you know that there's a um, upper respiratory infection going around, that's one good way to stop the spread. So I want to switch gears a little bit. So before this podcast, I looked at the figures and it looks like only 11.7% of eligible individuals over the age of 18 in the United States have gotten the new COVID bivalent booster. That leaves a lot of unprotected people, right? Especially, like you said, we're gathering inside for the holidays. The weather's getting cooler, so we're coming inside regardless. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? It's low. That's a really low level. It's not unheard of. So we typically have fairly low vaccination coverage for people that are 18 to 65. If you look at historic influenza uh, vaccination coverage, people just don't go out and get those types of, of vaccines because they don't perceive that influenza or COVID might be a threat. But again, it's one thing for young people to think about themselves. It's another thing to think if you might be around older people, if you've got grandparents or parents who you might be going around, it's a really good idea to get the vaccine that helps to stop you from spreading it to other people, if you might have an infection that's asymptomatic or even mildly symptomatic. We live in Alabama. There's lots of allergies. Right, you know, right. first the the pollen, then we get the leaves coming down yes. and the mold. And so people mistake regular allergies when they might actually have an infection. So it's it's important to try to get vaccinated if you can. That helps stop the spread to other folks. So I want to expand on that a little bit more on why people haven't gotten this the new bivalent COVID booster. Is it, do you think it's that people aren't as worried about COVID anymore because we're not seeing those high mortality rates that you mentioned that we saw in 2020? Is it that people, they've already gotten COVID, they've recovered, and so that they think they have natural immunity against COVID or is it a combination of everything? It's a combination of everything. There's been a, a great study from SEAL, which is an NIH funded event that, or funded uh, study that looks at people's attitudes and perceptions mm -hmm. toward vaccine during COVID. And people are saying, number one, the COVID shot is one that people have reactions to. There are lots of folks say, I don't have a reaction to the flu shot, but COVID, it made my arm hurt. I was tired for a day. And they know that from previous shots, so they don't want to get another right, shot. Right. So there's that, that fear of the pain that might come after. There's also this perception that they're not at risk anymore, like you mentioned. So that's what we're hearing um, when the scientists are going out and surveying people. But we don't have, you know, we don't have a ton of data about why people aren't getting vaccinated. So if someone, do people who got infected in the past and also get the COVID bivalent booster, do they have better protection against these new variants that we talked about earlier? They do. They absolutely do. So a previous COVID infection plus a vaccine seems to confer even more benefit in terms of risk of future infection. But again, remembering that this is a cycle and um, unlike influenza, that's an annual cycle. COVID happens twice a year. Right. right. So do the boosters do anything about transmission risk? You know, reducing the chances of passing the infection on to others. They do. They do. So when you get a booster, your immune system, it, it ramps up and you have um, more defenses when you come in contact with the virus. That means that once the virus hits your body, you're more likely to disable it and stop it from spreading to the next person. So last question, do you have any thoughts in general about this winter? Are we likely to see more sickness like you said, COVID, other infectious diseases, and what can we do to keep ourselves and our families safe? So I'll tell you from the data, it does look like we're going to have a particularly challenging winter. Influenza hospitalizations are up in October, and they're still trending up in November. That's particularly concerning because they don't usually go up that early. So as scientists, we're watching it to see, does this mean we're going to have a, a fairly bad flu season? COVID is likely to also go up because we've seen it cycling in Alabama regularly and having that peak in January. So definitely those, those things are going to be circulating. But that all that to say, that's normal. <laughs> Diseases do circulate. You can protect yourself and your family. Think about distancing when you need to distance. Uh, places where you might not need to go if there's a gathering you don't need to attend before you're going to go see your 90-year-old great-grandmother. That might be a good idea. 
wearing a mask if you're in close quarters and you're concerned about um, either your health or, or someone else's health is always a good idea too. Washing your hands when you leave the bathroom, singing happy birthday twice, all of the things that we've heard so far, those all help keep you safe. And don't forget how to take care of yourself as well. You need sleep, so be sure you're getting good sleep at night. That helps to give your immune system a chance to um, recover and respond. Balance your diet as much as you can, um, reducing the amount of sugar, making sure you're getting lots of brightly colored fruits and vegetables to keep your uh, vitamin levels up in your body that can help boost those immune cells. And then have plenty of time for fun too. Just enjoy yourself and um, take care of yourself as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Judd, for this timely and informative podcast. You've provided a lot of great information about these new variants and how to stay safe and healthy in this upcoming winter season. Thanks for having me, Mina. And thank you for listening. Please tune in next time for another episode from Standard Precautions and Beyond, Conversations in Infection Prevention and Control. 